morning and good afternoon, All One community. I'm so happy to be before you again. Welcome to our first DEI keynote speaker presentation for 2021. Before we begin, let's deal with some housekeeping instructions first. As a reminder, the Zoom platform allows us to have live Spanish interpretation during our session. On the bottom corner of your screen, you will see a globe that you can click to choose a Spanish interpretation. Today, Andrea Rocha will be serving as our Spanish interpreter during the session. For all the questions you may have during the session, please click on the Q&A button and enter them at any time throughout this presentation. Moreover, should you have any technical difficulties, please inform our IT rep, Tim, the teams to help you. Finally, I would like to take this time to anchor this presentation in, in acknowledging that info shared may be sensitive to some, but overall hope you gain a different perspective on the topic and I invite you to keep the discussion going. Without further ado, together let us welcome our Cosmic Engagement Officer, David Bronner, for a few opening words regarding our keynote speaker. Over to you, David. Damn. Right on. Thank you, Lorraine. Um, yes, it is my honor and pleasure to introduce the badass vegan, John Lewis. So John is an international public speaker, serial entrepreneur, wellness advocate, activist for the wellness of all living beings, and the film producer and director of They're Trying to Kill Us. At a young age of 13, John found himself at 315 pounds. But through hard work and dedication, he lost weight and excelled in football and basketball. He continued his streak of, streak of athletic excellence throughout his high school and college years with a full ride scholarship to Harris Stowe State College. Graduating with a bachelor, bachelor's degree in marketing, he later went on to pursue his MBA from Nova Southeastern University in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. John's education in business coupled with his love for health and fitness gave him the ability to start his venture, Badass Vegan, a health and nutrition company that strives to educate individuals on plant-based nutrition. John's love for his community brought forth the brainchild of Vegan Smart, a plant-based protein shake company with, with a foundation whose mission is to prevent obesity through education, physical activity, and plant-based nutrition. As a well-renowned well fitness expert, John Lewis has spent over two decades in the health and fitness industry and played Division I college basketball. John is highly passionate, passionate about not only his own health and fitness, but that of others as well. This is evident through his motivational messages, either through his international public speaking engagements or simply through his social media outlets. Today, John has taken his passion for health and is now directing his first feature length documentary focused on food and social justice. John has teamed up with the maker of the, of the award-winning What the Health to create their joint venture, They're Trying to Kill Us. All right, without further ado, John, take it away. I am. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you so much, Dave, for that amazing intro, uh, as well as Lorraine. Hope everybody's doing well. Thank you all for being here. Um, I just wanted to take a little time to introduce myself uh, in regards. Uh, my name is John Lewis, as he stated, stated before. Uh, I was born in Little Rock, Arkansas, raised in St. Louis, Missouri, now living in Miami. Uh, funny story is I wasn't always vegan. I wasn't raised vegan. In fact, my family owns the number one barbecue restaurant in all of uh, Tennessee and Arkansas, believe it or not. So they think I'm crazy, just so you know that. Um, but uh, I was raised there, raised in Ferguson, Missouri, as many people have heard about Ferguson through the unfortunate incident that happened to Mike Brown uh, Jr. Uh, in fact, you know, that was a, a main purpose of creating the film that I have right now. Mike Brown was actually, um, Mike Brown Sr. was actually one of the first interviews I have in the film that you'll see in the film itself. And uh, was raised there, uh, not the worst of upbringings, but it was pretty tough. Um, Graduated high school, went to play college ball at Harrisville State College, like, as he said. Then I ended up going to uh, grad school down in Miami. And uh, from there is when I actually 
uh, start to really focus on being an entrepreneur. But along the way, along my last week of graduate school is when I got a call from my brother who told me that something was wrong with my mom and we didn't know what was going on. Now, mind you, I am, you know, 6,000 miles away down in Miami. And so this is hard news to take, and especially in my last week of graduate school. Um, and I ended up talking to my mom on the phone that day. And I always tell people how I'm a happy-go-lucky guy. I'm always smiling, always trying to make other people happy around me. But at that moment, that was the first time I ever heard my mom like not in a good place. And when I asked her what was wrong, she said, son, I feel like crap. I don't know what's going on. And she didn't use the word crap. She used something very strong. And so uh, I ended up talking to the doctors and I asked them, you know, how did this happen? Like, you know, what's going on? They told me too much fried fatty food and uh, too much animal protein. And I immediately, you know, responded with this isn't hereditary. And that's when the doctor was like, no, this is a lifestyle choice. And it really stuck out to me. And I didn't go vegan immediately, but the more research I did, I did get to see that, you know, this ingestion of this animal protein wasn't just the causes of the likes of just colon cancer, but also, you know, hypertension, heart disease, stroke, type two diabetes, the list goes on and on. And I'm a big believer of learning from my mistakes, but I'm a bigger believer of learning from other people's mistakes. So if my mom is already going through this, there's no need for me to follow her down this path. You know, if somebody tries to run through this bookcase behind me and they don't make it through, I'm not gonna try to prove them wrong and, and try to run through the bookcase myself. I'm gonna show them there's another way around that. And that's the route I took with that. So um, at that moment, uh, I ended up going vegan and it's been around 15 years now. And uh, I am, happy and healthy and and I I know medications I have a lot of people in my family that have suffered from type 2 diabetes I'm talking about everything from leg amputations um, to strokes to the colon cancer of course to you name it our family's had so many ailments and you know for for me not to have to you know go down that road I'm not saying it was the easiest choice in the beginning but it I knew that it would they would pay off and um uh glad to say that you know i'll be 44 next week and i feel amazing and I, i'm my goal with everything that i do within the vegan community is to promote um you know happiness health and empowerment empowering people to see that they can take control of their own health i think a lot of times we find that when we get sick uh it's just supposed to happen now there are cases where it is unavoidable but there are cases when a lot of times it's our lifestyle that is leading us down a certain path. And I'd like for our lifestyles to lead us down a, a totally enlightened path, full of health, full of wealth and full of happiness. And um, so that doing that message, I averaged before the pandemic, I averaged around a hundred thousand sky miles talking all across the globe. Um, and kind of the movie kind of led to that, like how can I reach more people in a positive way and that's what led us to uh, doing this film. Um, and if you all are okay with it, I'm going to show you the trailer to the film. And that way it may spark some questions that you may have to ask me uh, as well towards the, uh, towards the end of the trailer. So if without further ado, I will show you that. I'm gonna share my screen now for you to see that. Um, let's see here. So this is the neighborhood I grew up in, right in Ferguson. A friend of mine was actually shot in his driveway, right there. You put drugs in the communities, put guns in the communities, you put disease in the communities, put poor food in the communities. All these things are designed to shorten your life expectancy. It's by design. It is not accidental that this is what's in the hood and this is what's over there. There's actually an active hand in making sure that we are living like this. It's all about control, money, and survival to them. Your death is not an expense to them, it's an expense to you. They're trying to make money from us, even if it's at the expense of killing us. You just die slow, your family just watches you die. The alcohol industry, fast food industries, tobacco industries target communities of color. Your health is not their main priority. They're trying to keep you sick. We are in a state of emergency when it comes to our health. 
Keeping people sick is very lucrative. Now you want pills, now you want dialysis, now you want medicine. You go into the hospital on a regular to see your doctor. Everybody's getting paid, except you. Big pharma and pharmaceutical companies are making billions of dollars off of all of us. As long as they can make that dollar, they don't care if you live or die. It's something about being here that's making black people sick. Everybody's getting paid, except you. You hurt me. There are more dangerous and harmful chemicals and products made for women of color. It absolutely is a crisis. They don't make a dime if you're healthy. It's kind of like a dope gang. It is the dope gang. It's just a bigger gangster, the mob boss. You look at the hidden hand, you see that government is feeding the crisis. We're fed wrong knowledge, sized all the wrong food. It's about money over people's health. If you can control a population's access to food, you can control the person. Only about 8% of African Americans even live in communities that have a grocery store in them. Because the deep root problem is the food. Because poor diets kill more brothers than pistols. You know, we fighting for our lives. That's like Michael Vick's pit bulls. As black men, we're dying off so quickly in so many ways. It's here, pocketed in our community. We don't want a healthy population. That is injustice, plain and simple. The powers that be that are making that money at the top, they trying to kill us. All right. So that right there is the trailer to my upcoming documentary. As, uh, as David uh, said before, it is uh, the follow-up film to uh, What the Health, if anybody has seen What the Health. Um, our main goal is diving into social justice as well as food justice. And, um, you know, a lot of people, that I've gotten this question before uh, in regards to, oh, you went vegan, so you don't care about humans anymore. And it's like, no, actually, um, that's a big part of the reason why I am still vegan to this day. Uh, one of the pivotal interviews that we had within the film is we talked to a hog farmer and still shocked that he allowed us to come onto the farm, but he did. And within that one farm in North Carolina, he has three lagoons. One lagoon alone holds 6 million gallons of hog waste. And not if anybody understands this or knows this, but nobody's buying hog waste. So what do they do with this hog waste? They actually have what they call spray fields and they spray this all across these spray fields. But what it does is it actually ends up poisoning the land. It poisons the water supply that's there. It also poisons the air. Um, and this is within a, fi a five mile radius and sometimes even more. And we uh, had John Hopkins run tests on some of the households and they ran cotton swabs on the walls, on the kitchen, in the, on the stove, on the toys on the tables and all the cotton swabs came back with one thing and it was hog feces. So these people are ingesting this, they're breathing it, they are living in it. And of course they're getting sick off of it. So when people are saying like, oh, well, bacon, it's like, okay, well, you're still supporting this too. And it's not just the hog industry, no matter what you're doing, if it's the you know, cattle, chicken, and you gotta think about any food that you're eating that is animal based, there is a farm that is involved with that and it all, trickles down and that's just one aspect of it and you know you don't even talk about the working conditions of the people that live in these that work in these slaughterhouses and work in these farms so there's a lot of things that go into it um i did see that there was a question available down there or i, I don't know if it's gone or not uh bertine hey <laughs> hey john thank you so much what an amazing clip it really, really makes us want to rush out and see the movie. But I do understand it's not quite out yet. Can you let us know when we might expect to see it in theaters or on Netflix or uh, be able to maybe show it on site at our headquarters? Uh, right now, fortunately and, and happily, we are actually going to shop the film around starting next week to all the networks. So uh really happy about that uh as of as of what streaming service will end up on we don't know yet um we are working with a team to uh basically talk to all of them and see which uh platform is the best option for us our main goal really is is the reach um 
is to make sure that it reaches the, the most amount of people. Um, and there are some networks that are higher up with that, you know, than, than others, but we're, whoever puts the effort in to market it to the most amount of people and get it in front of the most people, that's, that's most likely where we'll be at. Thank you, John. Our next question is, do you see wild caught seafood in the same light as pork, cattle, chicken, et cetera? Yes, I actually do. And uh, that's a question I get a lot. One of my, one of my answers to that is, and uh, thank you for the question, whoever it is, is that nobody that I know would walk up to any stream, ocean, river, creek, pond, whatever, and drink the water out of there. But what do we breathe all day? We breathe oxygen. What do fish breathe all day? They breathe that water. So if you wouldn't drink that water, why would you eat something coming out of that water? You can't wash off DNA. It's the same, you know, you can't wash it off. You can't cook it off. That's part of their DNA. And there's actually been studies of showing how a lot of these uh, marine life have been seen with a lot of like, uh, drugs and pharmaceuticals in them because people are dumping them and they're flushing them and they're ending up in these and then you got uh, the amount of plastics the amount of pollution everything that's going on with these waters so yes i would look at it in the same light as that if not as dangerous uh then then the cattle and chicken and and hogs thank you john next question um could you tell us uh, a little bit more about food access versus food deserts? Yes, uh, food access is when, if a, if a community has the access to the food and the food deserts, they kind of tie in together, but a food desert is basically, I'm sorry, we're going back to food desert. Food desert is when a grocery store is not in a certain vicinity of a community. For instance, a lot of times it's within a mile of that community. Uh, a great example of this is we went to the Navajo Nation, which you saw in the trailer, and they have a population the size of West Virginia, and they only have 11 grocery stores. That's definitely food desert. Um, they have tons of convenience stores, and they have tons of small stores, but not a dedicated grocery store. They only have 11 of those. And what we've come to realize is that there aren't really food deserts, it's nutrition deserts because there's food at those convenience stores, but what's the nutritional value of those foods in those stores? We have a lot of things that are going on in these communities where they just have no nutrition. They have food or what's labeled as food as John Sally said within the trailer, but it's not really food. Um, and then the access is how hard is it for them to get to that food? Is it, you know, can they just walk out down the street and get it? Or do they have to take seven buses? You know, all these different things that are that are in this. Uh, one law that we saw is that in California, you're only allowed two bags on a bus, or two, two grocery bags on a bus. So if you're shopping for a family of four or five, you're gonna be on the bus almost daily just in order for you to get enough bags to supply them for a week's worth of food. So food access and food uh, deserts actually fall in line with each other, but it's just a matter of finding the solution and understanding that we can uh, get these communities with access to this healthy food. Thank you. Thank you very much, John. Mm -hmm. um, another question for you. Um, you know, Black Americans are the fastest growing vegan population and are three times more likely to be vegan. To what do you attribute this? I attribute it to people being tired of seeing the sickness prevail. I think that they are seeing like, wait a minute, so we actually can change this? We don't have to go down the same path? And I always, I always say this quote, I said, nobody cares about dying until they're dying. Like, we think we're so invincible a lot of times. And I think people are starting to see like, oh, well, we can change this path. We don't have to go down the path, you know? And you start seeing a lot of our so-called superstars and icons passing away in their, in their 40s and 50s 
you know, you start looking at yourself, you start reflecting on yourself, like, hey, I'm right around the corner from there, you know, and and seeing that people are passing away, unfortunately, from diseases that have literally scientifically been proven to be avoided and or treated uh, with a certain type of lifestyle. So I believe that's one of the main things. It's There may be some other aspects as far as, you know, economy, you know, the planet and the animals, but I think a lot of it is coming from, they're just seeing like, wait a minute, I don't have to go down this path. And if I don't, if nobody's forcing me to do it, why am I doing it? Thank you. And um, we have a couple of more questions for you. Um, so an anonymous attendee wrote, John, amazing trailer. And thanks oh, thank for you. all your work. I'm a fellow vegan of many years wondering, can you share a few of your favorite organizations working on the intersection of veganism and racial social justice? Um, let's see, off the top of my head, there needs to be more. I'll say that, I'll start off with that, you know, there needs to be more and that's, that's a good question because there hasn't been many, but there are some. Um, Brenda Sanders, uh, and uh, I apologize, I can't think of the name of her organization, but she's in uh, Baltimore, Maryland. Mm -hmm. She's doing amazing work on the ground, uh, you know, with food justice and social justice, tying it together. She's mm -hmm. actually in the film as well. Uh, mm -hmm. I would definitely say her. Mm -hmm. um, now out in California, there is a young lady who is started a, uh, a grocery store by the name of Supermarket but she spells it basically taking out the vowels if you spell it out with supermarket but she's her biggest goal is to uh make these supermarkets in neighborhoods that need it the most um and giving them that food access that we talked about uh amazing organization um off the t and i'm sure there's more but off the top of my head those are the two that really stick out and that i know i've seen with my own eyes the work they're doing and it's just amazing to see um, how much they care. That's awesome. And another question that just came in, um, what is the most efficient way to provide access to healthy food? And by the way, I know you don't want to toot your own horn, but I know that you do make a protein shake. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, yes. Uh, so that, that was actually one of the, that was, that sparked the brainchild of making the protein shake, which I'm actually in the in the in the works of actually creating a whole line of badass vegan uh, uh, shakes and supplements. Still teaming up with my with my team, but we just we see that there's a bigger goal right now, and um, that was one of the main things. Is just that you know if we could provide something that provides all the macronutrients that somebody needs for a uh, for a great meal, and it's not you know $80 a jar. Like, you know, we have organic, we have non-GMO, but I just believe that, you know, it, you can help people and still not rob them at the same time. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I, I see it and there's no knock on the people doing it. If, it. if it works for you, keep doing it. But I didn't want to have an $80 jar of protein shakes on the shelf. It just, it didn't seem right. It just didn't seem right. And you'll see that a lot, whether it's vegan or not, you see that a lot. Um, so that's what I've, I've been working on a lot. Uh, and what was the what was the original question? I'm sorry, the flattery the flattery took me off. <laughs> oh, you're on mute still. I'm sorry, you're on mute. You're on mute. Oops, sorry about that. No problem. Yeah, so it was um you know along the lines of the most efficient way to provide access to healthy food. Most efficient. The most. The most efficient, I believe, is that uh, that grocery stores are held accountable for what they do. A lot of people don't know that a lot of these grocery stores, uh, for instance, they're, they, they sign clauses or they fix clauses into their contracts when they buy these grocery stores. For instance, in California, again, if a grocery store moves out of a, out of a building that it's occupied and say they signed a 20 year lease, and they move out within five years, they have, an, a, they have a clause in there that no other grocery store can move into that building until that lease is up. And why do they do that? Because they want those, that same community to follow them to where the new store is. 
and they know if there's another store there, it'll take away from their money. So I think, you know, holding them accountable is a huge step in that. And I think it'll keep them from leaving if they know that somebody else can move into that building. They, they leave without any hesitation because they know they don't have any competition at this point. It's almost like a monopoly on that neighborhood, on that community when they do it. So I think, I think that's a, a huge pivotal step to, to changing the game when it comes to this access. Thank you, John. So will they're trying to kill us be available in Germany and other countries? We actually are working on that. Uh, we did a crowdfunding about back in June, actually, and we ha it had great success. And one of the main reasons for the crowdfunding was to have it translated into about 30 different languages and have it available uh, when it does hit the market for streaming. Now, the only thing is we can't control the guidelines within the country. Because like, just for instance, on social media, I've seen that like, I got a lot of people, a lot of friends in Europe and every time I try to share a link with them and they're like, no, you can't share this link with them anymore. It's like, oh man. So it depends on the guidelines of that country. Now we are planning on translating it, but whether that country allows it to be there, that's another question. Okay, that's good to know. And um, an anonymous attendee has written, thank you, John, for all your hard work in spreading this invaluable information. I'm so excited to hear that veganism is growing thanks to your efforts. And you look amazing. <laughs> I'm wondering how people in these sorely undeserved communities are able to get vegan food if they are located in food deserts. Are there organizations trying to bring in healthy food into these communities? Yes, there are, uh, there are quite a few organizations. One amazing organization is uh, Support and Feed, which is ran by Maggie, uh, Maggie Baird, who is uh, Billie Eilish's mom. They've been doing a lot of major work in delivering food to underserved communities. But one thing that we've started to see, and this is one thing where a lot of these people are changing to the vegan lifestyle, is that mm -hmm. people are starting to realize that vegan food is actually a little bit more accessible than what we've been taught. Mm -hmm. um, for instance, rice and beans, you know, you might not want to eat it every day, but it is available right next to you. Mm -hmm. And I think we have become spoiled in a lot of ways to the point where we act like we can't eat the same thing every day. We can't, uh, <laughs> we can't, you know, incorporate the same food every day. But if you think about it, before the industrialization of the world, if you grew up next to a mango tree, what did you eat every day? You ate mangoes. So we have to kind of get back to that too. And you know, a lot of people think that veganism is expensive. In reality, veganism is not expensive. It's the products within veganism that is expensive. If you're buying the food and preparing the food yourself. Uh, one of the things, one of the major things in the book that I'm writing right now is meal prepping and understanding that like you can change your meals up, but change them up per week. What happens is a lot of times people want to eat a different thing every day. And now you think about the cost of that as opposed to the time of that. Now you've taken so much time to prepare these meals and you spend so much money. If you can meal prep eating the same thing for six days out of the week, you know, seventh day, you eat whatever you want, whatever the case is. But if you're able to time that down and eat that, let's say you eat beans and rice, a good friend of mine, uh, her name is Ch uh, Chef Charity Morgan. She was in the Game Changers movie, if anybody's seen that. Um, she has a great uh, aspect to it. She says, what I do is for my family and my kids, I'll cook the rice and beans and I'll have the salad, but I make five different sauces for the week. So now, Every day is a different sauce. They're eating the same damn thing. <laughs> but <they're> getting... <laughs> she said they eat the same thing, but they're like, wow, the green sauce today. Ooh, the, the red sauce. Oh my gosh. So it's, it's ways to do that, save money, save time, and still be able to be you know, healthy at the same time. What a great idea. I'm going to try that. <laughs> <laughs> so, so this next question, do you make vegan soul food? If so, What's your favorite recipe? Ooh, I I do. Uh, I I don't do it too often because I you know I know me. I have an addictive personality, as I talked about before. I was once three hundred fifteen pounds, so if I ate soul food every day, 
I'd, I'd be right up there. But there are ways. Uh, mac and cheese is one of my favorites. Uh, I still make vegan mac and cheese. Um, I'll make like a vegan pulled pork, uh, which is made out of jackfruit. If anybody's never had it, it's, it'll shock you. It'll, it'll Literally, you'll think it's pork. I don't know how nature did this, but it provided us with a, a way to do that. And um, and one of my favorites, and it's not necessarily on the savory tip, but more of a sweet tooth tip, because I do have a sweet tooth, and that is a pecan pie. And that is like a, a vegan pecan pie that is just, it's crazy. And uh, my mom, when I wasn't vegan, she had she makes this gooey butter cheesecake, which is amazing. And we and her and I, which my mom is not vegan, by the way, but she still works with me. Uh, we've tried to master the vegan version and we got pretty close. But uh, that's one thing I'm trying to master right now is with that. Yeah. <laughs> Sounds delicious. And for <laughs> everybody who's joined us, um, Kimmy made the most delicious pecan sandies. Uh, please go to our All One Lounge and pick one up. They are vegan. They are gluten-free, they are delicious. So in honor of this presentation and Black History Month, so <laughs> enjoy I yourself. Yes. <laughs> and um, the next one, poverty is a deterrent for potential vegans. Where in low-income neighborhoods? Healthier foods and vegetables are more expensive than meat and animal products. How do we tackle the growing problem of food inequality? Thank you, Nicole. Thank you for that question, Nicole. One of the greatest ways, and a lot of people don't like to talk about this, is our votes. Um, there's, two ways you, there's two ways you vote. You vote at ballots and you yeah. vote with your dollars. Right. You know, one, one example I always say is that, you know, stores are going to hold and provide what people buy. They might not care about your health. They don't care about your family's health, but they do care about their money. So if nobody is buying the junk in these stores, they're gonna stop providing the junk. Um, and then when you go back to the actual voting at the ballots, it comes down to voting for legislation and people in these offices that are gonna uphold healthy living. You know, We also gotta understand that the reason why this meat and dairy is so cheap is because it's subsidized. It's subsidized so heavily that if you took all the actual cost of making a burger, a Big Mac would be around $11. But since it's subsidized and it's got government help, that's why it's able to be so cheap. And then in your head, you're like, well, why would I go buy this, this fruit, which really is only probably a dollar more than this burger, but this burger has been marketed and promoted to me as the best thing ever invented. So that's why we have to get these people in office that are going to stop providing money to that, to those industries and start providing money to healthier options. Once we get there, you will see the tables turn and we'll, we'll, be, uh, we'll be able to afford it a whole lot better. Thank you. I think they should be charging about 11 bucks for a Big Mac. That way fewer yeah. people will buy them. <laughs> yeah, I, I always say this. I always yeah. say this to people. I said, don't ask why the healthy food is so expensive. Ask why the bad food is so cheap. Right, right. And I, I, I equate it to, and I don't want to sound controversial here, but I, I equate it to a drug dealer. Like, you know, a drug dealer will give you the bad stuff for real cheap, it's more addictive, you're more hooked on it. But now the good stuff is now the most, they make it so expensive. You know what I'm saying? Like, if you think about it, I always tell people, nobody I know loves cranberries, just regular cranberries. Nobody, nobody just will eat cranberries. But if you look at an ocean spray bottle of cranberry juice, it's filled with all these fillers and this crap that you don't need. And somebody will down a whole bottle of it in five seconds because it's been doctored with. And they make you think that that's the natural version. Until I moved to Miami, to be honest, I never had an avocado. I never had um, a plantain. I never had jackfruit. I never had kiwi. It was so many things I never had. All I had was the processed version. You know, it might be a soda, a mango soda. And I thought that's how mango tasted until I got to, you know, got around. I'm like, oh my God, this is so much better than this chemical in a can. 
So I think, yeah, once we get to that to that spot where we get to get our legislation in place and our government officials in place and they actually buy into this, then it'll work. Thank you. Mike Bronner just sent in a question from his brother. I have no idea who his brother is, but <laughs> here goes. Um, <laughs> Hi, John. You're obviously a great answer to the question that athletes can't thrive on a vegan diet. Can you address questions around calcium, et cetera, as a vegan? Yes. Uh, I believe that a lot of times people are worried with you know the nutrients, whether it be calcium, iron, potassium, whatever it is. And, I, I, and I, I'm a big promoter of, yes, you can get all your nutrients from plants, um, but we also have to be cognizant of the fact that our soil is not the same soil that it was thousands of years ago. You know, the apple that was full of these nutrients, it still has those nutrients, but the content is depleted a little bit. So I'm, I'm a big promoter of, if you feel that you need to take vitamins, you know, a vegan version, please take it. There's nothing... There's nothing worse than being, you know, depleted of something when you could actually, you know, be preventative and make sure you have it in advance. Um, so like, and, and I'm not promoting a certain brand of it. I'm just saying, make sure you that you eat a well-rounded diet, but also take care of yourself. If you're doing a multivitamin a day, making sure you're getting your B12, you know, along with your iron, along with your calcium. Uh, dark leafy greens are very high in calcium. But, you know, even sometimes as vegans, people don't eat all what they should. You know, there's all these vegan burgers, there's this vegan cheese, there's this vegan this and that. You know, you start eating a lot of products. Sometimes you are depriving yourself of getting those natural uh, nutrients that you need. But I would say when in doubt, if you are feeling that you are in need, please feel free to take a vitamin or uh, a supplement that you feel that you like. Yeah, and, and I think, you know, um, even as a vegan, you, you do have to be very careful to get yeah. those nutrients because after all, Oreos are vegan, are they not? Yes, yeah, they are. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and um, so Laura would like to know, who are your favorite vegan meal prep influencers? Meal prep influencers? That's a great question. I don't think I've ever gotten that one. Um, Jackie... Uh, she runs a page called Vegan Yak Attack. Um, while I'm in the process of making a meal prep book, she already has one out, which is amazing. In fact, she's most likely going to be my photographer for my, for my meals and my, and my book. Uh, but I would say Vegan Yak Attack is amazing. When you're talking about meal prep, there's great chefs out there, but there's nobody really tackling the meal prep side. Um, I would say Bryant Terry is an amazing chef. Uh, he's in the San Francisco area, uh, not necessarily meal prep, but easy and attainable and not very tough, not very hard to make. Uh, so those are two I would definitely recommend along those lines. Thank you. Thank you. Um, is food access control same way as the other minority race in other communities? I, I, if I understand the question correctly, yes, it is. It is controlled just like so many other things that have been engraved into our societal uh, norms, um, whether it be government, whether it be banking, uh, you, like, you know, you got to think about the housing situations. Um, there are so many things that were put in place before yeah. this era and the problem is, I, and I get a lot of people that will say, well, these people aren't, they aren't racist. They aren't adding to this. They aren't doing this. It's like, they might not have been the ones to implement these uh, mm -hmm. strategies and guidelines, mm -hmm. but they're not doing anything to get rid of them. So that's just as bad. And so there are so many things out there. I just, I just posted a case where um, it's not necessarily food, but it just shows the systematic uh, racism that are available. And there was a, a family who had their house appraised. And when they had their house appraised, they, it was appraised under value, they thought. So they finally got the bank to reappraise it. And when they had the appraiser come back out, it was a different appraiser, but same bank. They had their white friend put all pictures of her family in the house and took out all their pictures. It was appraised for 500,000 more than the first appraisal. 
And that's just one example. And there's examples across the board, you know, uh, you know, there used to be uh, red zoning where you couldn't buy a house in a certain neighborhood if you were black. Mm -hmm. They wouldn't allow it. Even if you made the money, they right. just wouldn't allow it. So there's a lot of things that come into play there. And we just got to get these systems. Again, we got to push the old out and put in the new that's going to help out everybody. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes, I agree. Thank you, John. Um, can you give an example of a successful community-based program that has helped increase fresh food access? If you have seen that, you have seen that may inspire others. One you thought was a successful mode. I think I better read that again. <laughs> I, I fumbled it again. I kind of got it. I kind of got it. You got it. You got it. Okay. Yeah. 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 An uh, example of a successful community-based program. Yes. I would have to go back to Brenda Sanders again. She's just, she's been in the community for so long and she's, I mean, she's just doing wonders in Baltimore. I mean, to the point where everybody's not vegan in that community, but they support her because they understand the work she's putting in for that community, what she's trying to do. And, mm -hmm. and, and I don't even want to say try because she's doing it and, you know, making it a healthier community. And she's very well versed in all of the legalities, the government, everything. She knows everything going on in that community. And she's bringing that fresh fruit, uh, actually providing jobs for people in the community too. Um, you know, I, I believe that the community center that she started and ran is actually developing its own vegan products and the people from the community work in the in the uh, building to make the products. So she's incorporating that as well as providing meals, as well as bringing fresh fruits and vegetables to the community. It's, it's really a wonder to see. It's, it's tireless job and probably a thankless job really, but she's doing amazing work out there. Uh, Brenda, Brenda Sanders is her name. Brenda, Brenda Sanders. Brenda Sanders, yeah. Brenda Sanders, thank you. Yeah. Sorry, <laughs> my country accent kicks in every now and then. I have to... <laughs> oh, thank you. And my Haitian accent. There you go. There you go. <laughs> I appreciate your work so much from an anonymous attendee. Thank you for sharing this wisdom. It is my hope that people can move to growing their own foods and eating locally to reduce trash and enhance the nutrient content yes. of the food that people are ingesting. We put so much into shipping oils and flowers when we have acorns all over the US. Wow, that's, that's, that's really cool. Um, Great point. What do you have to say to that, John? I, I say they're right on point with that because I, I always tell people all the time when people are like, oh, we got to stop eating processed. I'm like, well, you realize that mango you just had was processed. It just came from Costa Rica. You know, <laughs> like in order for it to get to you, it wasn't just, <laughs> they didn't just pick it, put it in the box and it's there. Like there's a process that goes with that. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and I do believe that. Like I, I know it's hard to tell people maybe in New York City living in a certain complex it's hard to grow your own food, but you know, mm -hmm. I think we can all start somewhere, whether you're growing your own herbs in your house, you know, mm -hmm. something as small as that to growing mm -hmm. something else. I have a good friend, her name is uh, on social media, her name is Super Dope Men. Uh, and she's showing people how to grow within her building in mm -hmm. New York. And you know, she's she's got all these different types of plants that she's growing and doing like educational services to people and showing them that. Mm -hmm. So there's a, uh, there's great aspects of it, but I, I think, I think they're right on point with that comment though. There's a lot more that we can do locally that would help tremendously with everything. Yeah. At Dr. Browner's, we have our food forest and our region region. Um, and we have the best apples growing in our food forest and our employees are welcome to go and pick what they want. We have herbs and you know, fruits and it, it's pretty cool. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. When you visit, we will show you around. I'm ready. Um, <laughs> yes. So um, um, thank you so much for your advice and insight. You're truly an inspiration. Did you gradually become vegan? Some people become vegan overnight, feel lousy, then go back to eating meat. What is your recommendation? My recommendation is overnight. Um, 
I I did go vegetarian at first. And once I went vegan, I really realized I wasted two years of vegetarian, <laughs> to be <laughs> honest. Um, and I think there's like this fear of like, oh, well, I got to have this cheese and this and that. And it's, it's basically addiction uh, at the end of the day. And I, I believe that a lot of people don't realize like, you know, we're addicted to a lot of things. Food is one of the things we do. Like I always say the government gets a lot of things wrong, but the one thing they got right was when they called it the FDA because food is the most addictive thing we'll ever put in our body. And until you realize that you're an addict of something, you can't heal from it. If you in denial that you're an alcoholic, how can you ever heal yourself from the alcohol? And sometimes we are food addicts. Um, and that, that whole aspect of people feeling bad is that's basically cold turkey from an addiction. Uh, whether you've been doing something 5, 10, 20, 40 years, good or bad, if you stop drinking water tomorrow and you've been drinking water for 40 years, your body's going to be like, wait a minute, what's going on? So the same thing with the bad stuff. If you've been you know, eating meat and dairy and processed foods for however long and you cut it out, your body is going to be looking for that constantly. But if you stick through it, you're going to survive. Like nobody's ever died of eating healthy. Like nobody, like, <laughs> nobody was like, oh, well, they started eating healthy and they, they died. Like I, the name of my speeches used to be called Vegans Aren't Filling Up Hospitals. Because I used to tell people like, nobody got rushed in for a heart attack. And the doctor's like, well, what happened? It's like, oh no, he had an orange today and his heart exploded and we don't know what to do. Like, no, that's not the case. So if you stick it out, while it can be tough, and I know people feel like, oh man, I felt like I was going to pass out and die. Like, that's not going to happen. In fact, one of the greatest things about eating less processed, more whole foods is that you can actually consume more without the negative benefits. So a lot of times we don't realize is that our body digests plant, plants faster than it does animal uh, food. So with that being the case, your body burns it, expels what it doesn't need, and it's ready again to be replenished. But we're so used to the animal aspect where we eat once and then it sticks to us, which we're not designed to have food stick to us, really. Mm-hmm. That's not our that's not our digestive system. And that's not the way we're designed. Yeah, it's interesting so, you say that because some people will say, I just can't get full. Like, you know, I, I don't have yeah. that feeling of, you know, satisfaction right. unless I have a steak, unless yeah. I have chicken, you know. Exactly. So, yeah, I hear that. Classic, classic addict. Uh, quotes actually <laughs> I can't I don't feel the same unless I have this one drug it's the same same aspect yeah yeah and and I know you have two kids so the next question mm-hmm. is um what is a good way to get my kids and husband on a more vegan lifestyle what do you do at home with your kids well I'm very fortunate that my kids have been vegan since birth so they kind of don't have a choice but I've also dealing with clients throughout the years. Um, one thing that I've always done and it, it's been proven to work is that sometimes we have to remember that we're the parents and we're not, we're not always the best friend. We're not always going to be the savior in their eyes. Like we're still their savior, but we're not going to get that award or that trophy for best parent of the year. We have to do something. And, and we have to understand that if we know in our heart that something is wrong for them, and we continue to do it, what does that make us? So I think a lot of times I get parents and I, and I have to speak to them that way because if we understand that something is bad for us, if I know that I let my kid walk down those steps, he falls every time I let him walk down the steps. Am I gonna keep letting him walk down the steps? No. So it's the same thing, am I gonna keep feeding him that food? And I think also as a parent, um, we have to understand that we don't have to tell our kids everything. If you give them vegan food, just put the food on the table. You don't have to say, I think that's one of the biggest mistakes. People are like, hey, kids, we got vegan food. Automatically, they're like, oh, man, I'm not eating this. But if I'm eating it and they're eating it, they don't care. They're, they're just like, oh, I'm eating what my dad and my mom is eating. They mm-hmm. don't care. Um, mm-hmm. As far as the husband, I, I, I don't want to get too controversial. On that, so <laughs> I always say, hey, if, if you're cooking vegan food and they want something else, let them cook something else. If they want it, let them cook it. And, and, and then you have, to be, you have to be heartfelt with it and tell them like, hey, honey, I know you like this, but deep down in my heart, I can't, I can't do that anymore. If you want it, that's all for you, but I can't cook this anymore. Mm-hmm. And if you start 
cooking and not saying you're not cooking good food right now, but if you start cooking like real tasty, great food that fills them up, it's hard for them to question mm-hmm. that, you know what I'm saying? But I, I think it's, it's a lot of aspects to it, but you know, letting them know that that's not me anymore. And I, I understand if you want to still eat that, but as far as the kids go, you know, until a kid shows up at a grocery store line and pays for the food, you're the one buying the food. They're going to eat what you make. <laughs> right. I'm the parent. I'm the parent. <laughs> and so, um, Stacey wants to know, what do you think is an effective way to inspire meat lovers to at least reduce their meat and dairy intake? I believe, and this is, I've said this countless of times, uh, I believe that we have to be the example of what we're trying to get people to see. Mm-hmm. A lot of times we'll go to somebody like, no, you can be healthy and you can be, you know, this stress-free and this and that. And then the person that's telling them is the unhealthy, stressed out person yeah. telling them they need to go vegan. It's like, no, if you're going to tell people that, be that example. Right. And I, I believe that goes beyond measures of how effective it is because people, you know, people send people my page or send people, you know, Tori Washington's page or my friend Dom's Thompson or Johnny Juicer. They send us, they send people our pages and they're like, nah, that's a mythical creature. We don't know them. They're lying. They're not vegan. They did this, they did that. But when they know you personally and you're the one that's reaching out to them, they're going to listen to you. If they, and a lot of times you don't have to say anything. I guarantee you for anybody that's out there vegan trying to, uh, t- trying to, put this impression on somebody to do it the less you talk about it the more they're intrigued about it that's one thing I've learned over the years the less I the more I just started to shut up and start living my life people like man you still doing that vegan thing now you've opened up the door now they want to listen more but the more I try to be like hey vegan hey vegan you need to go vegan you need to go vegan I got more resistance that way but I noticed that once I just started living my life uh, I have a classic uh, example of a good friend of mine that I grew up with we were at another friend's wedding in a, as an, in adulthood, and she was so she'd be one of the main people on my post, you know, laughing at me being vegan. Oh, you're crazy! And she finally like the crazy part was she has my phone number, but she wrote me an email, and she was like, "All right, I'm tired of this. Every time we're at somebody's event, you're the happiest, most energetic. You're all over the place." She's like, "All right, I'm ready. How do I do this?" And it's been six years now she's been vegan. But it was because I never pressed it on her. I never put it on her. Like, I, I'm one of those vegans. I go with my friends to the restaurant that serves meat. I want to show them, oh, hey, what's your chef special? Can you tell the chef to make me anything that's vegan? I want them to have fun. Just make me all vegetables. Like, go for it. You know, like, they, they like to see that. And they're like, man, you really are about They're like, yeah, I'm about this life. I really am. <laughs> so uh, I think, you know, living by example is definitely key. Thank you. Leave, living by example. Yes, yep. absolutely. Um, and Emily says, so inspired by your journey and the messaging you're spreading. How can we support you and your mission? Oh, thank you. Um, I, I think it's just word of mouth. I think, you know, word of mouth is amazing. And I think sometimes we forget about how important and vital it is to you know, what people are doing on their mission, whether it's me or anybody else. Like, sometimes it's not a financial thing. It's just like, you know, let people know about the work that this person's doing if you really believe mm-hmm. in them. Like, for instance, today, like, I, I probably name dropped 20 names already, you know, just because I, I believe in, you gotta, you gotta up these people. You gotta lift them to this platform so people can mm-hmm. see them. Uh, mm-hmm. But I appreciate that. And I, I think that's the biggest thing is just word of mouth. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Thank you. And... An anonymous attendee writes, when writing about veganism, I've often taken the stance that food is a form of activism and that we should all choose meals that mitigate climate change or reduce animal suffering. However, because systemic racism affects who has access to what, is it misguided or even elitist to say that everyone should be looking at their meals as a form of activism? I don't believe so. Um, I believe I believe it's more racist to say, don't worry about your health. 
just keep eating what what's bad. And I'm, I'm not saying that this person's saying that, but I think that's more along the lines of not caring for the person. Um, it can seem elitist because we've grown to this place in life where we believe that I can just do me and I can eat whatever I want and nobody has to pay the price. But in regardless, I, I mean, on the other side, as I always say, but what about the other side? What about your health? What about the end of the day? You know, so many people are about this YOLO life now. You only live once and all of this. I'm like, yeah, everybody, nobody cares about dying until it's time to die. And so if we can prevent this, if we can honestly go there and it's like, hey, it may not be elitist to eat rice and beans every day. But if I know you're going to be healthy and then we can add some vegetables to that and we can add a little bit of a vegetable broth and we can do this and we can doctor this all up. That's not elitist, you know, uh, I mean, because if you think about it, is it elitist to tell somebody to go eat McDonald's and Hardee's and, and Wingstop every day? And you're, and you're paying in essentially you're paying more money by doing that. You just in your head, you don't think you're paying more money. But the, the staples that I've named, and there are more staples available, I can get for $40, I can almost go two, two and a half weeks off of that. You're talking about Wingstop, you're talking probably $40 one pop for one person. So I think that's where we got to kind of take a step back and, and understand that some feelings might get hurt, but some lives will be saved. Good point. And, you know, people worry about malnutrition, vitamin D. Um, so that, that's, um, that's the next question. What safety precautions should be considered with a vegan diet for a baby or child, given the risk of malnutrition from lack of vitamin D and B12? My kids are since birth. And uh, I think it's a lot of myth involved in that. Mm -hmm. um, whether it's uh, breastfeeding, there actually are vegan formulas out there for children if, if, a, if a woman isn't breastfeeding. Um, and they still eat food, they just don't eat the meat and dairy. Uh, my, my son, which I mean, it's kind of my fault because of my DNA, but my son won't be three until June, and he's already three foot four and 42 pounds. So not malnutritioned. Uh, and he's, I mean, he's solid. It's not like he's like overweight or anything like that. It's just, but as a vegan child, he's on the mark. He's over the hundred percentile for everything. So I, I think sometimes we're just so, we're so worried about traditions and the norm that we forget reality. And the reality is the nutrients are there available for us, for the children, for the adults, but we just have to not be so engraved into the old norm and understand that, you know, a, a mother, a mother for the most part, there are some extreme cases, but a mother for the most part will provide the nutrients needed through the breast milk. Um, you know, it's been scientifically proven that uh, a mother's breast milk will actually adapt to what the child is lacking in and provide that through the, through the lactation process. So, you know, Mother Nature is an amazing thing. And sometimes, somehow we got to this point where we're like, no, Mother Nature don't know what it's doing. We got to give it this cow's milk. It's like, no, why would you give them the milk of a creature that grows to be 2,000 pounds almost mm -hmm. into a human body whose natural state roughly won't even be over 200 pounds, mostly. You know what I'm saying? Like, and then a calf grows into a cow within 12 months. It takes us almost 18 years to get to our full size. So we're throwing a concentrated version of a larger being into a smaller being that takes longer. And we wonder why we have complications. Well put. <laughs> Mother Nature <laughs> knows best. <laughs> so, John, I love the great mantras on your social media site. So please bless us with some, some words of encouragement as we go through this journey. I think the the biggest the biggest mantra and the biggest takeaway is empowerment and love of self. Um, I think a lot of times there are so many factors against us in this world. I, no matter what your race is, to be honest with that, there's so many factors against this world that make us that teach us self hate 
mm-hmm. that we don't even realize when we're hating ourselves a lot of times. You know, that food that we eat, sometimes it's because of stress. Sometimes it's because we're mad about a situation and we don't know how to, we don't have a proper outlet, we result to food. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's bad food a lot of times. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I think that if we in, encompass ourselves with love, with self-love, then everything else falls into place because one of the biggest things that people fail to realize is that there is no outside force that can that can actually provide you with love they can enhance the love you already have inside of you but they can't give you love it's just like when you're full of hate you can't even receive love think about it i'm sure everybody in here has been in a situation where they were in a hateful spot in their life and somebody tried to show them love and encouragement and it actually pissed you off because your your heart and mind was not in a place to receive it. So if we start replacing that with love, love of self, we'll see a lot of things change in our lives. And that'll trickle down and butterfly effect to somebody else because they'll see our happiness and our healthy, healthy lifestyle. And then that'll transfer over to them. So self-love is one of my biggest mantras is if you love yourself, the world will follow. Ah, thank you, John. We love you. We love ourselves. We thank you so much for spending this hour with us. We do have a few more questions, but we're out of time and I hope you don't mind Uh answering them after we end. I'll get back with you. All right, great. Well, thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, David. Thank you, Lorraine. Thank Thank you, you. Andrea. Thank you, James and Tim for getting us up and running. And Uh thank you, John. Love, love, love. Thank you, everybody. Nice to see everybody. And thank you all for coming in. (laughs) Thank you. Enjoy the rest of your day. You too. Bye-bye. Bye.